Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Objects That Change the World lecture series organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Miami University Alumni Association, today we present the Model T with Steve Kahn. Steve Kahn is the W.E. Smith Professor of History within the College of Arts and Science and is author of numerous books on American history. Most recently, Nothing Succeeds Like Failure, The Sad History of American Business Schools, published by Cornell UP 2019. Uh, questions were collected during registration and Steve will attempt to address some of those today throughout the webinar. You'll also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking ask a question on the bottom of your screen. Please note that in the interest of time we have available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for those questions and answers. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Welcome to you and thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for that introduction, Molly, and it's really lovely to be here, wherever here happens to be in the virtual world. Good afternoon to those of you joining, or even good morning if some of you are in a different time zone. My talk today is part of this uh, semester-long series called Objects That Change the World, which has been organized by the Alumni Association and the Miami University Humanities Center. This series invites us to think about objects that have reshaped our human experience. And thus far, we have considered everything from porcelain to the birth control pill to concrete to the first blues recording. Uh, I have seen these talks. They have set a very high bar for me. I am not, uh, I am in no small way uh, a little intimidated by all of that. The Humanity Center is really one of the great things at Miami University. And so let me also thank in particular, Tim Melly, Pepper Stetler, and Aaron Elliott, who are the people who make the Humanities Center run. If you would like to become a friend of the humanities, please consider donating. Yes, it is time to donate to the center in any amount that you can give. Annual gifts from the Friends of the Humanity are vital to funding the Humanities Center's programs, its workshops, fellowships, student programs, and its alumni outreach efforts. Fulfilling the center's commitment to students, faculty, and the public would not be possible without the generous support that we have already received and that we continue to need. Please join those alumni and friends who have already invested in the humanities because every dollar really does make a difference. So to find out more about the Humanities Center, you can just Google that, or you can go to humanitiescentral, one word, dot miamioh.edu. When you get there, you can click on the red box uh, to, uh, to make a donation, or you can go to www.givetomiami.org, give to miamioh.org, forgive me, backslash Humanity Center, all one word. So again, I'm really delighted to be part of this terrific series, which I myself have been enjoying over the course of the semester, and uh, and I hope that I will do the series credit. Now, let's, um, let's get to it. Let's get this show on the road, as it were. I'm going to share my screen here. Give me just a moment to make sure that we can get these slides up. Let's see if they pop up here. There we are. Okay. And I'm going to Whoops. Are we are we still there? We're still here. Okay. And, the, and the slides are still there as well. Very they good. Are perfect. So my topic for today is the Model T, which I will argue today is an object that tr surely changed the world across the last hundred years. And I want to talk about this in, uh, as you see here, uh, in four different ways. I want to talk about the way in which the Model T changed our notion of industrial production, how it changed our conception of the economy, how it transformed our landscapes, and how it reoriented our position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. So with that all by way of uh, uh, introduction, fasten your seatbelts, if you'll pardon, and uh, let's get this show on the road. Except that my slides are now not quite working.
Let's try this again. I apologize for this. There we go. Okay. So let's just talk. start with the basics. Henry Ford produced his first Model T on October 1st, 1908, and he produced them until the end of May in 1927, an almost 20-year run for this model. It was, until the 60s and 70s, the longest continuous run for a particular model of an automobile until it was supplanted by the Volkswagen Bug. It was a small, uh, easy-to-build car. It retailed for about $22,000. It was not cheap in 1908. It was durable. It was lightweight. You can see some of the specs there. And across that 19-year period, Henry Ford produced 15 million of them. So think about that number for just a moment. As I said, it revolutionized the production of a consumer product. That revolution began here in Detroit, and you can see the etching here, it's the uh, Ford Motor Company's Highland Park assembly plant. What Ford did was to put the production of the automobile on a moving assembly line. Now, automobiles are not new, obviously. They've been around since the late 19th century. They have tended to be luxury items, uh, often handcrafted, uh, especially those European models. Henry Ford standardized it, regularized it, and put it on this mass production assembly line. He was borrowing the technique to some degree from meatpacking plants. Uh, which had pioneered the use of these overhead conveyor belts. They were called, and, and pardon, I know we're here at lunch, they were called disassembly plants, where the animal came in at one end, was hung up by its hooves, and went down a line where it was disassembled so that all of the various products that were going to be sold uh, wound up at the end of the production line. Ford reversed that, right? He took the parts at one end and a Model T rolled off the end uh, of the production line, off the assembly line, into the lot. What this assembly line did, as Ford began to develop it early in the 20th century, was to reduce the time it took to make a Model T Ford, as you can see, and this is by 1917, from 12 hours down to an hour and a half. Um, that's, as I said, 1917, keep that date in mind. That time is gonna be reduced even more dramatically in the 1920s. And of course, with mass production comes lower unit costs. And so the Ford Model T became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as it was mass produced in greater and greater numbers, down from $825 in 1908 to $350, give or take, in 1917. Now, in 1917, America enters the First World War. Ford is planning he, uh, for uh, the, the Highland Park plant becomes part of that war effort. He's planning for an even bigger plant, this time just outside the city of Detroit in Dearborn on the River Rouge. And it became simply new, known as the Rouge plant. What Ford imagined, this kind of almost imperial vision that he had, was a production site which would be completely vertically integrated. What I mean by that is that Ford would be able to, to build a Model T literally from scratch on that site. He starts, it takes uh, 10 years to build. As I said, he starts it during the war when the Highland Park plant has been uh, uh, turned over to some wartime production. He uh, sets up docks along the river so that he can bring the iron and the coal barges in. He builds big coke ovens. Coke is necessary for the manufacture of steel. Blast furnaces come next. Uh, a foundry, which was the largest in the world at the time. He wants to manufacture all of the Model T's components right there on site. And at its peak, the Rouge plant employed uh, roughly 100,000 people. Think about that for a moment. Uh, that's just, it, it was, when it was completed, and it's right before the Great Depression, it was the single largest industrial plant in the world. Ford's vision doesn't simply end uh, there on the banks of the River Rouge. Uh, over the course of the 1920s, he buys his own coal mines in Kentucky. He buys his own iron mines in Minnesota limestone quarries in Michigan, coal 
iron, limestone, that equals steel, uh, which is the, the foundation metal for the car. Ultimately, he, he has landownings of about 700,000 acres across uh, much of the middle part of the country to produce all of, the, all of these raw materials. He owns his own ore fleet uh, that, uh, that, that goes up to those docks that he has built. He owns his own regional railroad. So coal coming out of Ford, um, coal mines in Kentucky go on Ford uh, railroad cars, which go to Ford barges, which go up to Ford's River Rouge plant. Even th th this vision doesn't even end in the United States. In the 1920s, Ford also uh, recognizing that uh, there was no place in the United States that would produce rubber uh, for the various rubber components of a car. He purchases in 1927, 4,000 square miles of Brazil. And he, uh, he, he imagines that he's going to create the world's largest rubber plantation. He called it Fordlandia. It was a flop. It never worked. Uh, but nonetheless, it gives you some sense of this incredible vision that Ford had Ford have of revolutionizing the production of a consumer product. The Rouge uh, was, as I said, the largest industrial site in the world. It also became a symbol of America's productive power. And I want to spend just a moment talking about the Ford as a symbol and how it was uh, imagined and represented here in the, in the uh, interwar decades in the 1920s and 30s. As, this, as the Rouge plant, you can see it there from the air on the right. You can see it on one of the shop floors on the left as people are working at those machines. In 1927, Henry Ford hired the photographer and modernist painter Charles Sheeler to do portraits uh, of the Rouge. Uh, you know, at, 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 like, like you take your, your, your kids off to get portraits at the holidays. Ford wanted a photographic um, uh, uh, record of this incredible thing he had created. Sheeler was a well-known uh, photographer at that point, and Sheeler is just gobsmacked when he gets to the Rouge plant. It's thrilling, he said, the most incomparably thrilling subject he's ever photographed. Let me just show you a couple of those. 1927 blast furnace. What you're seeing here is these, these extraordinary black and white photographs which capture the stark geometries uh, of an industrial site. There is something, I, I will argue, you can disagree with me, there's something just extraordinarily beautiful, aesthetically pure about this image, but of course it's all unintentional. Everything you see here is functional. And what Scheler was able to see was, was the beauty, the aesthetic pleasure out uh, that, that could be found in a purely functional industrial site. His triptych called Industry, 1932. We think of triptychs like that, and that's the way the photographs are initially arranged. We think of, of a triptych as, a, as, as a, a, a medieval religious form. You, you've seen them in the cathedrals, you've seen them maybe in the art museums, two panels on either side, large panel in the center. Uh, Schiller has, has played with that idea to say, this is the American religious site, this is, the American place of worship. And of course, just a few years earlier, President Calvin Coolidge had famously or infamously, depending on your point of view, uh, said in a speech, the man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there worships there. And, and here is that almost religious veneration uh, that you can bring to, um, to the River Rouge plant uh, arranged in this triptych. That's what he was hired to do. Sheila then took a lot of these images uh, and turned them into his own paintings. I, uh, I'll show you two here that I'm particularly fond of, American Landscape, 1930. If we think about this in the context of the tradition of American landscape painting, especially that 19th century tradition, where the goal was for painters to glorify the natural beauty of the nation, the Hudson River Valley in the 1830s and 40s, uh, the big spaces out west after the Civil War, Sheeler is saying something quite different. He's saying this is now the American landscape. 
uh, find the beauty, the 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 awesomeness, uh, the the way this inspires awe in the same way that those 19th century natural landscapes did. Again, the extraordinary geometries, um, the way that they're arranged. Or this one, classic landscape. Uh, I love the way the parallel train tracks shoot from the lower left-hand corner of the painter painting off to the to the right-hand side of the painting. Uh, classic landscape, well, what does that word imply? That word, word implies uh, Greece and Rome. And, and Schiller again is saying, this is, this is our Greece and Rome. Here is our Parthenon. Schiller's not the only artist to have been inspired and, and brought to Detroit uh, to, to make use of the Rouge as, um, as an artistic subject. Uh, Henry Ford II, Henry Ford's son, uh, brings Diego Rivera, the great famous Mexican muralist, to Detroit uh, to do a series of murals based on his observations, his tours of the River Rouge plant. So here is Detroit Industry, 1932-33, 27 panels. Uh, they are, as, as I hope you all know, uh, in residence ensconced in the central courtyard area at the Detroit Institute of Art. Uh, if you haven't seen them in, in their location, then you should turn this your laptop off and, and get in your car right now. It's an extraordinary experience to stand in the courtyard and look at these, at these images uh, like that. Uh, where you can see uh, the relationship that, that Rivera is trying to um, to develop visually between these machines and these human beings, the one straining with the other uh, in this furious, heroic act of producing Model T cars. Um, I put this one in here just to give you a sense of scale because you can see the, um, the door on the left-hand side of this image. So you can see just how big these are and they, they in, encircle the entire courtyard area. Uh, so Schiller, Rivera, the Rouge becomes a symbol now, not just a place of production, but a symbol for all the possibilities of production and for uh, America's industrial might. And not just in this country either. The image you see on the right, Henry Ford in the middle, meeting with uh, two members of a Soviet delegation who come to Detroit in 1927. They are fascinated by the River Rouge plant. They are fascinated by the scale of production, the way in which Ford has standardized production and therefore made it regularized, less expensive, et cetera, et cetera. It's remarkable that Ford would have met with these people given Ford's own politics, uh, which are deeply, deeply conservative. And nonetheless, he strikes a deal in 1929 with the Soviet Union uh, and the deal is essentially that, he, that Ford will send some of his own engineering experts over to the Soviet Union to help the Soviets set up their own automobile factory in Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, and in exchange, I think the Soviets agreed to buy some number of, of Henry Ford's cars in return. Um, again, this deeply conservative and some, might, some would argue reactionary American political figure is venerated in the Soviet Union. Uh, may God preserve him, says Joseph Stalin in 1944. And in fact, the Soviets do produce, not a Model T, uh, by the 1930s, they're producing a Model B. And there it is uh, with, uh, you know, a, a Ford with Soviet characteristics uh, being made in this uh, factory in Nizhny Novgorod uh, because of Ford's um, uh, cooperation. So, as I said, the Rouge becomes an international symbol of industrial production. Now, that was Act One. Act Two, uh, the way in which the Model T changes our conceptions of how the economy works. Uh, it was simply given a name. It was called Fordism. It's a word that begins to pop up in the 1930s and, and is, is used by economists and other commentators across the decades of the middle 20th century. The formula of Fordism is that you can marry mass production with mass consumption. That's new. 
America's had big factories before, but they tend to produce things that none of us is going to buy as a consumer, like enormous amounts of steel. Uh, and so now what we are mass producing are the things we are going to turn around and buy ourselves. That's Fordism, that, that you can be a worker and a consumer at the same time. This begins with Ford's experiment, 1914, with the $5 day. This was announced uh, by the Ford Motor Company, and it sent shockwaves through the American industrial economy. It wasn't actually a $5 day, you know, depending on, you know, how things were going. You, you probably made in cash like two fifty dollars or two seventy-five dollars a day, and then there were other things that you accrued that added up to a $5 day. But nonetheless, Ford is concerned about his employee turnover. The turnover at his factories is very, very high. They're not nice places to work. So Ford believes that if you pay people enough, they'll put up with the conditions of the, uh, of the River Rouge plant. And he's, and he's right. Turn, uh, employee turnover declines pretty dramatically uh, after the $5 day kicks in. Ford is also deeply, deeply hostile to unions. And he believes that, again, if you pay people enough, they won't be tempted to join a union. But then he recognizes, and lots of other people recognize as well, if you pay people enough, they can afford to buy your own product. And this is really true. People who worked for Ford at the Highland plant, at the Rouge plant, uh, it became almost an expectation that you also would buy a car that you had helped to make. Uh, that, uh, that being a Ford employee and driving to work in a Ford went hand in hand. Uh, so you can, you can bring your wages up and that can also increase your sales as well. When he does this, uh, and again, especially after the First World War, there's that, that interlude there uh, at, um, in 1917, 1918, uh, other industrial employers start to do the same thing. It is indeed a gold rush uh, started by Ford's $5 day. Once the war is over, what we can really see in the 1920s is a fundamental shift, a pivot in the American economy away from a production economy and toward increasingly a consumer economy. Today, give or take, by anybody's best guess, about 75% of the entire GDP of the United States is uh, selling of goods and services. Uh, about 25% of it has to do with producing things. So this shift from a producer economy to a consumer economy begins to take place decisively in the 1920s. And it's associated with a whole raft of new mass-produced consumer products, radios, uh, maybe first and foremost, the, the, the 20s is the great age of radio. The first commercial radio station goes on the air in 1920. And by the end of the decade, uh, something like two thirds, 70% of all American households have a radio. Uh, but household appliances, vacuum cleaners, blenders, electric refrigerators, these are all new, all mass produced, all being purchased now um, and brought into American homes. But nothing symbolized and drove, again, pardon, that shift towards a consumer economy more than the automobile. Here are a couple of advertisements. I love these ads uh, from, from the, you know, the teens and the 20s. Uh, the, the, the style of advertising here is to tell a story, to tell a short story that pulls you in uh, in order to sell you the car. So here's the companion of her holidays on the left. And here is the car for the young businessman on the right. Cars, maybe first and foremost, are at the center of this new shift towards a consumer economy in the 1920s. Fordism, uh, uh, workers who can buy, workers who are also consumers. It really is a car economy. Uh, we become an automobile people in the 1920s. There are 1 million car sales in 1921, 5 million by 1929. 8 million cars registered in 1921, 23 million registered cars on the road in 1929. That's a threefold increase. 
by 1929, and you all know why that's the important date, right? The, the depression will, will alter this uh, to some degree. By 1929, 3.7 million Americans are working directly or indirectly uh, for, the, for the automobile, uh, either in those factories or in all the ancillary things that, that the car has brought with it. So the, the Model T really does initiate this transformation in our economy and the way we conceive of the economy. Okay, that was Act 2, Act 3. The Model T, I will, I will now argue, begins a transformation, a profound and utter transformation of the American landscape, uh, turning it into what we more or less recognize today. Let's go back to the uh, to that Model T for just a moment. One of the things that I think uh, kids in particular enjoy about uh, about these old cars are those wagon wheels, uh, because they, of course, don't look anything like the, the wheels that are on your car today. It is true that when Henry Ford first started toying with the idea of cars, he was using these wheels made by uh, Detroit's wagon makers. Detroit was a center of the wagon building business in the 19th century. Uh, and, and those spokes uh, around the axle, uh, the wagon wheels originally rimmed in, in metal and Ford replaces them with rubber and eventually with inflatable rubber, rubber tires. But the reason we're still using wagon wheels is, is not because they're quaint and cute, uh, but because the roads are terrible. Uh, this is typical. Uh, there are almost no paved roads in the United States, let's say, uh, when Henry Ford first built that Model T in 1908. Paved roads, if they exist at all, exist in big cities. Um, once you got out of those big cities, this is what you would face, especially during the spring thaw and rainy season. And so those those wheels are designed to navigate the mud, uh, to navigate these rutted roads, uh, which are frankly just terrible. The, the Model T is very good at bouncing up and down in and out of those ruts, but uh, Americans, uh, especially as they buy more and more Model Ts, become less and less patient with roads that look like that. Right after the war, the United States Army, the Department of the Army, uh, puts on what it called the first transcontinental Army Motor Transport Expedition. Um, try saying that three times fast. Led by a young lieutenant named Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the, the Army had developed a set of vehicles which it had wanted to use in the First World War. The war ended before the army was able to send those vehicles over there, and but the army still wanted to give them a test drive, as it were. So they organized a great caravan, a couple of hundred of these uh, army vehicles from Washington, D.C., all the way out to San Francisco. Uh, and as you can see from this image here, uh, the trip was something of a disaster. I mean, they made it to San Francisco ultimately, but about six weeks late uh, uh, based on their schedule because the roads are so terrible. This, uh, this motor transport expedition kind of helps to kickstart uh, a drive in the 1920s to build better roads and to pave them, to grade them and to pave them in order that they are able to accommodate the growing number of Model Ts that people are driving. Between, uh, it, during, during those two interwar decades, there it is, 1921-1941, you can see that uh, the, the, the number of miles of paved road in this country just explodes by, uh, by about a million, a million miles. This is a road that connects uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, with it's a town in Maryland whose name I have now forgotten. And again, there are the wagon wheels. There's the mud. This is a, in the early 1920s. Uh, keep that house in the back of the image there in mind, just above the car, uh, because here's what it looks like. There's that house again once that road has been graded and at least given some kind of smooth surface. Paved roads now. Uh, spread all over the country, as I said, enabling people to drive faster and farther and transforming uh, the American landscape. If you're going to be out there on those newly paved roads, taking longer and longer trips, of course, a, a gasoline-powered internal combustion engine needs to be refueled. 
And so again, across those interwar decades, the filling station, the pumping station, or now we just call them the gas station, uh, they begin to proliferate like the proverbial mushrooms across the landscape after a rain. Uh, 317,000 of them by 1929, but even during the Great Depression decade, another 130,000 of these filling stations uh, pop up. Um, the demand for gasoline is more or less insatiable, unquenchable, uh, and, and these now become uh, visible all over big cities, small towns, then the spaces in between. This is what we are used to right now, that you will never have to worry about running out of gas because there will always be a gas station somewhere nearby. The 1920s sees the first mass tourism. Uh, again, because of the Model T, because these roads now reach into more and more corners, of the continent. It enables ordinary people, middle class people, uh, to take a tourist holiday. We, we've had tourism before. In the 19th century, uh, if you took a tour, uh, you tended to be maybe a little more affluent. Uh, you did it on the train or maybe on a boat. Now uh, you can you can get in your car and you can explore this country in a way that had simply never really been possible before. You might stop at uh, one of these tourist camps that again spring up all over the place in the 1920s. Uh, you can see this one is simply called the Tin Can Tourist Camp. It's in Florida. The, this is a, a colorized photograph here. Uh, that, that Tin Can refers to one of the nicknames that the Model T had, the Tin Lizzie. And, um, and, and so it doesn't look like my idea of a nice camping trip, but, but nonetheless, there, there it is. Uh, tourism now becomes part and parcel of, of the American experience. And the American road itself becomes distinctive, uh, different from, from any place else in the world. This is the great writer for Fortune Magazine, James Agee in 1934, talking about the great American road side, all of the things which pop up, trying to attract your attention, trying to take your money, uh, as you are now driving on these great American roads. They will always be there, he says, as long as the American blood and the American car are so happily married. And by the 1920s and 30s, they were certainly happily married. What he's referring to are places like that. Now, why would you turn a diner into some weird version of a Dutch windmill? Well, just because, because it will attract attention, because driving down that road, you'll see it and you'll be intrigued, you'll be charmed, you'll be amused, you'll pull over, you'll spend your money. Those of you that have, have done any of this kind of driving may know that the kind of, maybe the biggest one of these uh, uh, roadside, what should we call them, roadside attractions uh, is in the southwest corner of South Dakota, Wall Drug. Uh, which features, among other things, the jackalope, a combination of a jackrabbit and an antelope. Uh, it features as well a 60-foot blue fiberglass dinosaur uh, because, because this is now, you, because you can turn the roadside into a kind of circus, attracting people and attracting their money uh, as they are driving more and more from place to place. And indeed, the American road trip has become something also of, uh, of an American tradition. Let me, let me give a shout out to my colleague, Professor Andrew Offenberger, who taught uh, a whole course on the history of uh, the American road trip last semester, a course I wish I'd been able to take. Uh, it captured, uh, at least for some generation of Americans, uh, in the 1957 novel by the beat writer, Jack Kerouac, Whither Goest Thou, America? in thy shiny car in the night. Um, that's, a, that's one of my favorite lines from that novel, being out on the road. And that is the only plot in that novel is just moving, just being out on that road. Again, that happy marriage uh, in the American blood of the road and the American blood. That novel comes out in 1957, just a year after President Dwight Eisenhower, remember him in 1919, President Dwight Eisenhower signs 
the most significant piece of domestic legislation that, that he signed during his two terms in office, the Interstate Highway Act of 1956. It authorized 42,000 miles of high speed, limited access, paved, free roads across the United States, mostly linking urban areas to each other, uh, but also traversing great and vast empty spaces as well, like the space between, uh, say, Cheyenne, Wyoming here, and Salt Lake City there, where they're really, they don't, they don't hear you when you scream out there. Uh, this, as I said, uh, um, becomes, um, uh, accelerates this movement that Americans have out onto the road, uh, changing again that landscape altogether. Now Americans don't drive on uh, two-lane um, rural roads anymore when you want to get someplace. You get on the highway. You get on it for free. Uh, and the funding formula for this was also quite interesting. The federal government, that is to say federal tax dollars, paid for most of this. Uh, to the tune of 90 cents for every dollar. So if you wanted to build uh, I-75 through the state of Ohio, the federal government would pick up 90% of that cost. The state of Ohio would have to cover 10% of that cost. So it's a way in which driving got subsidized uh, by federal tax money. And as a consequence, we have created an auto-centric landscape. That is to say a landscape built by and for the use of automobiles. Here is a great tangle of roads, a spaghetti junction. I don't actually remember where this is. It hardly really matters. It could be almost anywhere uh, in the United States at this point. Could be Los Angeles, I don't think it is. Uh, could be uh, Atlanta, maybe. Could be Dallas. Um, this is what the American landscape looks like. And what I want you to notice is just how much space is taken up now for the high-speed use of cars. Uh, it, it, acres and acres and acres, the car uses space, consumes space at an extraordinary rate. Yes, gasoline it consumes, uh, steel and, and, and metal and rubber, yes, but it consumes space uh, in, a, in a really uh, extraordinary way. It's the car that makes possible the suburbs, and again, I don't know where this is. It doesn't really matter because you can see these kinds of suburban developments as you come, uh, let's say, uh, out of the clouds into an airport outside any uh, major city in the United States. And you can see that they are built, um, uh, the, the, the driveways connect to the, to the um, tertiary road, which in turn connects to an arterial road, which probably takes you to a highway. Everything about this space is designed uh, for the convenient use of the automobile. And indeed, by 1960, give or take, uh, residents, 90% uh, of the residents of the new post-war suburbs owned a car, 60% of those owned two. Uh, because of course, if you can't get anywhere without driving, and dad drives off to work in the morning, mom is gonna be stuck at home. Uh, take the kids to, to school, need to drive, go to the grocery store, need to drive, uh, the hardware store, need to drive. So families pretty quickly uh, felt that, uh, found that two cars was not a luxury anymore, it was a necessity. Uh, that also is a, a transforms our landscape transforms the very spaces in which we live uh, as well. What you're looking at here is a classic vernacular style called the American Four Square, uh, a house built, let's call this 1890s, maybe 1910, uh, with a front porch. The porch is one of the great uh, American architectural inventions, a big, spacious, open space, which is sort of in between the inside and the outside. And you can see the steps connect to the sidewalk. You sit out there uh, on a nice evening, you wave to the neighbors as they walk by. Now, of course, the first thing you're greeted with in a post-war house is the garage, and often the two, and increasingly the three-car garage. No porch here, no interaction with the rest of the community in that way. You drive into that garage, you walk into your house without interacting with another human being. The car transforms 
the very space in which we lived. And if you look at this, uh, this, this is a this is a single family, uh, uh, sorry, a single story ranch house. Look at the square footage that that garage occupies uh, as compared to the rest of the house. As I said, the car consumes space. You go shopping now at the mall, not on Main Street anymore, not in downtown. Uh, these enormous retail operations, you can see here from the air, and again, I don't know where this image is from, uh, but it doesn't much matter. Uh, you get to this place, it's ringed on three sides by fairly large roads. You can't walk there. Kids aren't going to bike, gonna there. bike there. It's far too it's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous to do that. Uh, so uh, you so drive, drive to the park, park and, and you shop, you get back in your car, you drive back into your garage. That's now the way we live our lives designed for and by the automobile. Oh yeah, and those parking spots. Someone has estimated, someone I trust, has estimated that there are roughly across the country two billion parking spots. Now, think about that for a moment. This is just an overhead of, a, of another shopping mall parking lot here. Uh, you can see you pave it over, you stripe it uh, to let the cars park. Uh, think about the even even uh, in a city like Oxford, the amount of space on the street devoted to parking, parking lots, parking garages. If you do this arithmetic, you multiply out two billion by the square footage of the average standard parking spot these days. You come up with an area eight point two five million acres, paved over and striped four times the size of Yellowstone. By comparison, the state of Illinois is about 775,000 acres. Uh, the state of Connecticut, about 3 million acres. Uh, this, as I said, is a transformation of the landscape in a relatively short period of time, unlike almost anything that has ever happened in human history. Now, that was act three. Let me talk about act four the way in which cars reorient our nation's position to the world. You're looking at Charles Wilson, that portrait there, chairman of General Motors. Now, I know that's not Ford, but General Motors, bear with me. In 1953, President Eisenhower nominates Wilson to be Secretary of Defense. That's a new position created in 1947. Uh, and there's something, I think, quite important, symbolic, um, that uh, that that to occupy this new position, uh, Secretary of Defense Ford has uh, 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 Eisenhower has chosen the head of a big car company. His confirmation hearing in the Senate has become again quite famous or quite infamous, depending on your point of view. For this exchange, he's asked by a senator whether there's ever going to be a conflict of interest because after all, General Motors is a private profit-making corporation, and now he has to put the nation's interests, the nation's security ahead of that private property. Are you gonna be able to make that decision? Mr. Wilson, the Senator asks him during the hearings, to which Wilson replies, I can't conceive of any kind of conflict of interest because I thought what was good for our country was good for General Motors and vice versa. I, the, the difference simply did not exist. Our company is too big. It goes with the welfare of the country. Our contribution to the nation is quite considerable. Um, pause and think about what that means, the way in which the automobile now really has become, uh, you, you know, sort of the beating heart of so much of the rest of the nation. We begin to measure our economic growth in terms of new car sales and so forth. Wilson presided over the Defense Department in the 1950s. Eisenhower's successor, John Kennedy, decided to go to the Ford Motor Company to pick his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. Uh, McNamara uh, was uh, a, a younger man, uh, known as one of these, uh, we might call him today a quant. Uh, he was terrifically good with data analysis before we even had that word. Um, it's a cautionary tale, perhaps, uh, about our fetish of data these days uh, and our veneration of all things numerical, because, of course, what you may remember of Robert McNamara as 
Kennedy and Johnson's Secretary of Defense, is that he was the architect of the Vietnam War. After he left that office, uh, he spent the rest of his life uh, wondering how it had all gone so badly wrong. He never quite apologized for it, but he certainly did ask for forgiveness uh, for a, from a lot of people. Let's jump a few years ahead to 1973. And again, some of you may remember scenes like this. In 1973, Americans were introduced to the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, it had been around since 1960, but I suspect most Americans were unaware of it, uh, a cartel which controlled the oil coming out of especially the Middle East. In 1973, because OPEC was angry with American foreign policy towards Israel, it decided to stop selling oil to the United States. Americans discovered that not only were they addicted to oil, they were addicted to foreign oil. And when that embargo took place, seems like you see here became quite common, rationing lines at the pump, gas stations closed altogether. In some places, uh, you would, it would be gas would be rationed uh, five gallons at a time, so that's all you could buy. Uh, some states went to a even odd rationing system, so if your license plate ended in an even number, you could buy gasoline on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If it went, if it ended in an odd number, you bought it Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. But we discovered uh, just how dependent we were on uh, that oil derivative gasoline for everything about our lives. That, that love affair which began with the Model T in the 1920s uh, wound up 50 years later uh, with gas lines, rationing, and a lot of really, really angry Americans. In 1980, President Carter, in his State of the Union address, announced what would be the, Car the Carter Doctrine. He put it this way, any attempt to gain control of the Persian Gulf will be regarded as an assault on the United States and be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. Now, Carter had several reasons for introducing this Carter Doctrine, but that Arab oil embargo was certainly one of them. We were going to police the Persian Gulf to make sure that the flow of oil was never going to be interrupted again. Carter was uh, painfully aware of the anger the, and, and the political backlash that, uh, that came with the oil crisis of the 1970s, and now he has committed uh, American military uh, to protecting that flow of oil. And indeed, that continues to this day. The U.S. Navy's fifth fleet, based in Bahrain, uh, continues simply to, to uh, cruise the Persian Gulf to make sure that the oil tankers uh, are never impeded. It's another way in which our car culture, our, our automobile lives are subsidized uh, by the federal government and by federal policy. Ronald Reagan, when he became president in 1981, simply doubled down on the Carter Doctrine. He created in 1983 what was called, what is still called CENTCOM, the Central Command. I think it's based in Tampa. And again, it is designed uh, to respond to anything that, as you can see, threatens U.S. vital interests in the Middle East. And let me just, if, at the risk of stating the obvious, sand is not a vital interest in the Middle East for the United States. Oil is, uh, and oil to make sure that people uh, don't experience the kind of pump shock that they experienced in the 1970s. Gas, oil, uh, and, and your car uh, are also a part of the uh, ongoing, you know, what some people have called the forever wars in the Middle East, Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm not sure I ever thought that I would wind up quoting Alan Greenspan, the oracular uh, head of the Federal Reserve for so many years, but here is the quote from his 2007 memoir. You can see Alan signing copies of that book. Uh, the Iraq war is largely about oil. Oil in turn is largely about our car use, uh, at least at a political level. Uh, so it, our, our, the Model T initiated this uh, infatuation, this dependence on automobiles, which of course 
uh, meant that we have been embroiled in the Middle East since the end of the Second World War as a way of protecting the oil on which those automobiles depend. So that's my fourth act, four ways in which I believe the Model T uh, set forward a series of revolutions across the 20th century, which still reverberate. And I'll end with this. I think the person who, uh, who recognized this profound transformation that the Model T was going to make was Henry Ford himself. Even as he starts construction on the River Rouge plant, he's beginning to understand that he is responsible for changing the nation. Uh, what you're looking at here is an old map of Ford's um, museum, Greenfield Village, again in Dearborn, not too far from the plant itself, uh, a, a vast collection of historic, mostly 19th century buildings that Ford bought all over the country, transported and put down in this ersatz village uh, that he created in the 1920s. Um, What's remarkable about this, of course, is that it is a, a, it's a nostalgia for a pre-industrial world, a world of horses and buggies, a world of uh, manual agriculture and handcrafted goods. It is not a world that Ford himself, it's the world Ford grew up in and the world he destroyed uh, by creating the processes of mass production of consumer goods. The very first building Ford collected uh, for this museum, 1919, was his own family's farmstead in rural Wish uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, the reason he bought this in the first place uh, was because he heard it was going to be torn down, uh, fittingly enough, for a road widening project. So I'll end with that. Greenfield Village, Henry Ford, the Model T, an object that changed the world. And let me pull off the slides, and I'll look forward to answering questions. Steve, that was fascinating. I don't know if we've had an object yet that had such resounding impact on the world we live in. I mean, from infrastructure to, you know, mass consumerism to, I mean, the economy, home design. I mean, really, it's far reaching. And I, you don't really think about that when you get in your car every day and think, wow, this really changed the face of how we live, what we do, and where we go. Well, thanks for saying that. This is why you keep historians around, right? Is oh, to remind sure. you of some of these things. That's our job. Learn, yes, absolutely. Okay, so we do have a couple questions. Sure. Um, this one I think is a really great one. So had Henry Ford not existed or decided to go into banking or, you know, some other line of work, do you think the United States would have been, um, you know, so dominated by individual auto automobiles versus public transportation methods? Or would so, we still be driving horse and buggy? Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's the kind of question, of course, that historians don't like because it's hypothetical and I can't give you any archival evidence one way or the other. It's the kind of question I would rather answer over a beer uh, than in an academic setting. Um, I think the answer is probably somebody was going to figure out a way to make cars a widely used consumer product. Whether or not, uh, were, were there other roads that we could have taken? Yes, I think that's probably true. Uh, and I do want to stress that technology is never really a motive force in history. Technologies exist in a kind of neutral way. It's, it's the choices that we make politically and otherwise which determine how those technologies affect the rest of society. And so I do think that um, the, uh, the, the kinds of choices that we made about uh, road building and public versus public transportation, uh, I think could have been made differently and we might be looking at a different kind of a landscape uh, and so on and so forth. But it's a great question to ponder. Absolutely, thank you for, for at least speculating on that. We appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, here's a good question that came in during registration asking about today's lean process. And I, I do believe that the lean um, methodology is a, the brainchild of the fine folks at Toyota. Um, yeah. Are there roots to the lean process um, in, in the Ford Motor Company? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. That, and I'm, let me just confess uh, that that I don't know the ins and outs of all of that. What I will say is that the the kind of vast scope of vertical integration that Ford imagined with the River Rouge plant in the 1920s did fall out of favor. Uh, and so I think that um, the development of um, uh, uh, extensive networks of supply chain, which we've talked a lot about during this pandemic, um, is is in some ways a reaction against that kind of vertical integration uh, that Ford was imagining. I think companies now want to be able uh, to to get their parts from someplace else. Uh, in a way that's sort of you know just in time. They don't have to warehouse it. They don't have to worry about um, the overhead costs associated with it. But I am not an expert in this by any means. Um, I, as I said, I think um, I think River Rouge stands at the apex, uh, but but I'm not sure it was um, copied, especially after the Second World War. Absolutely. I think maybe a learning tool more than more than yeah. anything else, perhaps. Absolutely. Okay. A couple other questions about the Model T itself. What does the T stand for? Yeah. Uh, you know, as best as I was able to determine, uh, it was uh, simply a, 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 a letter assigned to a variety of different iterations of this that he was experimenting with. Um you know, Ford famously, um, he, he was he was a child of the 19th century, uh, and he was a kind of um, uh, 19th century Protestant in a lot of ways. He didn't like fancy things. He didn't like frills. And so he didn't want to give his cars, I mean, it was a model and it was letter T and that one, and then it was replaced with model A uh, and so forth. That's as best as I've been able to find out. Uh, but other people who've, um, I will say this, if people are interested in this kind of stuff, the Henry Ford Museum um, has a tremendous website and archival material. And if you want to poke around, uh, I've used, uh, their their uh, website for some of my own research. It's a terrific operation, and I highly recommend it if people want to dig around. Um, and the Ford, Mo Ford Motor Company itself also has its own company archives, which are also very well kept, and there's lots of good stuff to find. Fantastic. Thank you for the, the tip there. So the Model T became the Model A. Here's a question. Were there other variations of the Model T? You know, like today, there's a, the sedan, there's yeah. the touring. Was there anything like that with the Model T or was it just the Model T? So I think that one of the things that, um, one part of the story here is that uh, Henry Ford, as I said, produces the Model T for a long time. And because he was that 19th century moralist, he had this conception that nobody needed any kind of a different car. This was perfectly good. It was adequate for everybody. Um, by the 1930s, um, Ford, Ford had dominated American car sales. Now he's being challenged by General Motors, which mm -hmm. is a, 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 a agglomeration of a set of other smaller car companies, which recognize that there are niche markets uh, so if, if you're wealthy, you want to buy a Cadillac. Uh, you don't want to actually buy a Model T if you have the choice. And, uh, and if you are, uh, you know, a working class person, then the Chevrolet is for you. So I think General Motors is really the company that begins to recognize that different consumer choices for different niches in the market can be a much more successful way to sell cars now uh, post Model T. Excellent. I see how they became a, a significant rival of the Ford Motor yeah, Company. Indeed. Yes, absolutely. Okay, another question here. Um, this comes from Brad. Did anybody in the government ever attempt to go after or raise an issue um, with Ford being a monopoly with his Rouge plant and, yeah. and other endeavors to corner the markets? Not so far as I am aware. Now, the 1920s uh, altogether was, um, th there's very, very little by way of anti-monopoly activity that comes out of the Department of Justice. So even if there were a case to be made, uh, 
Warren Harding, who's, who's president from 1920 to 1923, and then Calvin Coolidge, uh, they're not interested in pursuing antitrust um, uh, litigation. I think it's also fair to say that there, you know, Ford, Ford was the dominant uh, for, uh, motor company, but there are lots of others as well. So it isn't, in a sense, uh, that kind of complete monopoly. Lots and lots of those little companies actually don't survive the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, or they get swallowed up uh, by bigger companies. And so after the Second World War, you really are left with the so-called big three, uh, uh, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Uh, and they dominate the market as a as a triumvirate until the early 1970s, mid 1970s, when uh, Japanese car companies begin to sell automobiles in this market really for the first time. And that's actually connected to the OPEC story as well. But I didn't get into that. Excellent. All right. We appreciate that answer. Um, and then maybe one last question or so. So I don't envision a car lot you know, in let's say 1922 or whatever, how are folks getting their Model Ts? Were they going to Michigan and picking up their Model T or were there like local sales? Yeah, Ford, Ford pioneers the dealership. Uh, and so uh, Ford dealerships pop up all over the country. Uh, they are connected very tightly to the home office. One of the things that Ford dealerships had to do was to sell copies and subscriptions of Henry Ford's own newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. So you might be sitting there in Nebraska buying a Ford, uh, but there would be a copy of the Dearborn Independent in the showroom uh, in, uh, in, in, in 1925, because uh, that's one of the things that the dealers had to do. So that's how the sales worked. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. And then one last question. Any idea what the miles per gallon was on a mile? On a mile <laughs> you know, so. that's a great question. Um, I, I, I I don't know. Um, they're very light. Uh, but at the same time, I, I'm going to guess that those engines aren't particularly efficient. I thought what you were going to ask me is that when Ford actually starts tinkering around with cars, battery powered cars are are around. And, uh, and they are more or less, they, they, they sort of get crowded out by gasoline powered cars. And we've been driving gasoline powered cars ever since. Now, of course, General Motors has just announced it's going electric. And so in some ways we've, we've come full circle back to the early 20th century when it looked like electric cars were really gonna be the way this was all gonna go. Well, that's that's actually interesting that you say that because I was just reading something about Bonnie and Clyde, and I read that Bonnie had suffered terrible burns in a car accident from leaking battery acid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing I always imagine gas powered, fuel powered right. cars, but now it's now it all makes excellent. <laughs> Thank you so right. much for like connecting yeah. those dots for me, Steve. Well, those are all the questions we have for the day, right. and. Oddly enough, we are out of time. So that was just perfect, perfect ending there. We thank you so much, Professor Steve Kahn, for leading us in this webinar today. Just a reminder to our viewing audience, a recording of the presentation will be available on our website soon. Um, and to learn more about the important work of the Humanity Center at Miami and other lectures in this series, please go to humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. And to donate and become a friend of the humanities, please give. Please go to give to Miami OH dot org slash humanity center and as always please check out our other new and archived webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash miami oh thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this really fun and informative webinar have a great day love and honor to you all thanks